Welcome back to my workshop. Well, here I am, it's August, I'm on my summer holidays and the weather's a bit miserable. It's a bit cold, it's not very nice, a bit grey. So I've come into the workshop and I'm going to make something I've wanted to make for quite a while. So as I've got a bit of time available, what I'm doing sitting there in the garden first thing in the morning having a cup of tea, watching the birds wake up. Sounds rather nice, doesn't it? So let's see if we can do one. So we'll start off with the ends of the bench. Now one of the woods I use quite a lot of um, is red cedar wood. Um, and these are two bits, some offcuts I've had from a previous project. It's six by two or 150 by 50, if you like to work in metric. Red cedar is an excellent wood for working outside in the garden. Um, it's relatively waterproof. And if you put a basic oil on it or something like that, it should last for years. So I'm going to start off by doing the back. Now what I've done is I've gone around and I've measured everybody's legs um, just to make sure I get it just right. And I've come up two inches or 50 mil from the bottom because that's going to be the tenon. Up 30 centimetres, 12 inches. In this case I've worked in centimetres, so we'll do it all in centimetres. So we come up 30 centimetres, then I've left some space which is 75 mil, seven and a half centimetres for the base of the chair and then I come back at an angle because I want the whole thing to recline. This is a chair for the garden, I want to be able to sleep in this. So we come back at an angle. On this side I'm just doing 50 by 50 um, and that will be the front upright. Now if I cut these two bits out and I do it on both pieces that should give me the end frames or the start of the end frames for the chair. So whilst you weren't watching I cut the back piece out and I've also cut mortises. Uh, this is the one for the seat, this is the one for the bottom of the back, this is the one for the top of the back. I've also cut a little one on the front here and this is going to be for the side going between here and the front post. You'll notice that the mortise on what will become the back is much bigger than the mortise you see on the front. That's because I want this piece to line up with what will be the top of that. It'll all make sense when you see it in the end. So for the moment we can put those to one side. These are the pieces that I've milled uh, to be the back. I've got the front and back um, main, main piece and that is a proper three inches by two inches. Good solid piece of redwood. These two pieces are going to be across the back and then there's going to be little struts. That one will go up there and there'll be little struts going that way um, and we'll get even more fed up cutting mortises in a minute. Now this project, like so many of my projects, depends upon you being able to cut a mortise and a tenon. This is a fairly standard woodworking joint and as much as anything else it's the ability to mark out accurately. You can get machines to help you but it's quite helpful to know how to do it by hand. So the first thing you need to do the hardest bit I always think is cutting the mortise, that's the hole. So I've marked out on my piece of wood this is the end, well these are the ends of the mortise and I've gone along the sides there. Now, in order to do that, I've used one of these tools. Uh, this is called a gauge. And you can see what it does is it scribes a line all the way along there. You clamp it onto the piece of wood and make sure you put a little block or something just to protect the piece of wood you're working with. But you want to hold this down really tight. You see on the chisel, there's two sides. There's a flat side and there's a beveled side. So I want to put the flat side up against the end of the mortise. Hold it in nice and firmly. And you hit it with a mallet. You do the same the other end. Never hit a chisel or any wooden handle tool with a hammer. 
you always want something soft edged or soft faced so a mallet a soft faced hammer now we're going to go down the sides unfortunately whatever size malt is your cut it never quite coincides with the chisel you're using so now we've cut around the edges now we're ready to start chiseling out in the middle so you turn your chisel so the bevel is underneath so that you can then go like that if you go that way you just go straight into the wood and if that's what you want that's great but that's not what we want at the moment so little pieces when you got to there So now I repeat the process. And you just keep doing this until you go down to the height that you want. And that there is a basic mortise. I mean, you might want to clean it up a little bit, and I shall when you're not watching. Well, once you've learned to master this joint, you'll be able to do some fairly complicated woodwork. So, why bother with a mortising machine? Try it by hand. You never know, you might even like it. Mm. Well, I did say this was a project that depended on cutting mortises and tenons, but I'm beginning to wish I found some other way of doing it, because I'm getting a bit fed up. Right, I've now assembled the back. I've also cut the mortises for the bits coming forward. I've made the legs on the front and I've cut them across the front. So that's all there ready waiting to be done. So now we've got to look at the back part here. Now this is going to be the bit you actually rest your back against. And so I want to put some slats there. Now obviously these need to be mortised and tenons um, so they're all going to fit in together. Now theoretically these are going to be 45 centimetres apart. Looking at it I'm two millimetres out. So we'll just put that down to rubbish workmanship on my part. Um, but even I get it wrong occasionally. So I wouldn't dare admit it. So we need to consider the spacing on these. Now this we know is 90 centimetres. So if we put this one here on about the centre, which is there at 45 centimetres, each one of these is 50 mil. Yep, I reckon that works, in which case I need nine of these. What I shall do now is disassemble all of this. Be really careful to make sure I get this the right way around. And that, as they say, is the right way around. So I shall mark up on here all the mortises that need to be cut and just slowly work my way through. That means another 18 mortises. When I get to the end I shall work out just how many I've cut but it's probably about 50. Um, so if you've never cut a mortise before by the time you get to the end of this project by God you'll be good at it. Well, we're starting to get to the point now where we can assemble some bits and pieces and as you can see this is the back um, and that will then fit on there now when I've got the last piece in and it all fits and assuming it's all doing what it's supposed to do and uh, then what I'm going to do is I'll disassemble it I'm going to sand all the edges I'm going to run a bit of sandpaper down the edges of here just to take the edges off make sure so they're nice and rounded um, and then I shall glue that up and then leave that to dry. So here we are, this is just sort of the first clue of what it's actually going to look like. So we've got the basic frame 
now assembled. I still need to do something at the top there and these need to be leveled because we're going to have an arm across here. And if we wanted to, we could stop at that and that would make a fairly decent garden bench. Uh, I think I'd be quite proud to have that in my garden. But I want to make this into a rocking chair or a rocking bench. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make some rockers to go along the bottom. Now, when you measure it, assuming your measurements are the same as mine, I've got 40 centimetres between the insides of there. Now as I see it, I need about 15 centimetres in front, which means this then becomes 65 centimetres, and it's do I have 25 or do I have 30 centimetres at the back? I think the worst thing you could possibly do is to tip a rocking chair backwards. So it's perhaps almost better to have too much at the back. So at which point I'm going to cut myself two pieces of wood now, 95 centimetres long, um, and that's going to be the basis of the rocker. I have allowed in this leg here about five centimetres. So it's around about there. I've got it marked on the back here. So what I should be doing, I'm going to cut a circular tenon on this bit here, on each of these four legs. And that will then go down into a circular hole um, in the rocker itself. But first of all, let's worry about making the rocker. So to make life easy for myself, we ought to do the runner. I've created myself a pattern. So what I've done is I've marked on here where the legs are going to go. I must admit I cheated. This curve here I got by putting this piece of wood up against an existing rocking chair that I already have. Um, and then I've used my gauge set at two inches just to follow round there so I can guarantee that's what I want. And then I've put in these little notches. So we've now reached the point where we need to join the legs up to the rocker. And the way I'm going to do this is by using a circular tenon. So what I've done, first of all, is I've cut a square tenon. That may seem a little odd that I'm going to do a square one into a circular one, but it will make sense in a moment. And so I'm going to use a couple of my wheel writing tools. First of all, this one's called a spoke pointer. And that just rounds the top off to make it easy for me. Now I have several versions of this. Um, this one is probably a Victorian tool um, and it's a, a chair bodger's tool. And what it does, it just two cutters and it cuts a circular tenon. Unfortunately it's designed for a brace and bit and I don't have one of those anymore. One day I must get around to getting one. And that just fits straight down into the hole and then it'll go right down into the rocker so we'll have lots of strength um, that actually goes that way around we'll have lots of strength and it'll be a lovely joint lots and lots of glue inside that lasts forever now the last section we need to make is the armrest and so to help me i've cut the template this side goes on the inside of the chair, this is the outside. Um, I've made it deliberately this shape so I've got something nice and wide, it'll rest an elbow on. And I've made the end deliberately round so you've got room for a cup of tea or whatever is your tipple. There comes a point in every project where you've just got to try it. Now I've only glued the main frame together, these slats aren't fixed. Um, there's pencil marks all over the place, it needs sanding down, it needs polishing, it needs finishing, um, it needs the glue to dry, all those sort of useful things in life. But this is so good. <laughs> it fits me beautifully. I think I'm going to thoroughly enjoy it. All I need now is a cup of tea just here and perhaps a chocolate biscuit. <laughs> I'm a happy bunny. This is about as good as it gets. 
Well, this has had all night to dry. I must admit, this is looking rather good. I'm rather pleased with this. So the last job is to fit the slats. Now again, I've cut these to size. This is a proper tuber one. And I'm fixing them one inch apart. Um, So don't be shy, lots of glue. Now to make it easy, I've just cut a piece of wood that's one inch wide. And what I discovered when I was making hot tubs a while back is that if you use normal steel screws with cedar wood, it doesn't like it, and one reacts with the other. So you have to use stainless steel screws. So I'll just go ahead and fix all of those now. And then after that, it's a good sand down, and then we'll start to consider the polishing. Well, it's time to put a finish on it. Now there's a couple of options. You could if you wanted to. You could if you wanted to cover it in varnish. But as a matter of policy, I rather hate varnish. Um, I always prefer something a little bit higher quality, but I'm sure weatherproof varnish would do the job. Uh, so, what I'm using instead is what's called Danish oil. This is just a weatherproof oil that soaks in. Uh, give you a sort of a satiny type finish, which I rather like. It's easy to apply. If you put enough layers on and you polish it, you can get a high sheen. Um, in this particular instance, I'm just going to put it on as thick as I can. Let it soak in, give it a couple of coats. It needs a couple of hours to dry in between each coat. And this will be a lovely weatherproof and attractive finish. Well, there you go, the finished product. It was a little bit of effort, but by heck, I think it was worth it. Thanks for watching.